America was at peace, but it was an unsteady peace in that week before December 7th. We were still struggling, struggling in the uh, depths of the Great Depression, although unemployment for the first time had actually dropped below 10%. Unemployment during all the 1930s under Roosevelt had been in the high teens, the low 20s, but because of the step up in military spending, because of the, our Lend-Lease policies, uh, we were putting a lot more money into the, the war effort, even though we weren't at war. And this was, this was helping to uh, stimulate the economy and in the war industries in Detroit, munitions, shipbuilding, all those things that were churning out what we were referring to then as the, as the emergency. We didn't call it the uh, world war because we weren't involved. It was just called, it was called the national emergency or it was called the emergency. America was at peace. Um, people were going about their daily lives, listening to their Philco radios, listening to their General Electric radios, uh, Washington. Congress had gone out of session the Thursday before uh, December 7th. The night of December 6th, as tensions are heating up in the Pacific, Franklin Roosevelt sends a last minute communique to Emperor Hirohito pleading one more time to restart talks. Let's talk about Thailand. Let's talk about mainland China. Let's talk about your military designs. Let's talk about your political designs. Ironically, Hirohito never gets the message. And of course, as we now know, there was a convoy that had sailed from Tokyo Bay two weeks earlier and was just several hundred miles off of uh, Hawaii, the island of Oahu, that night as Roosevelt's making this plea. Uh, Mrs. Roosevelt that night was having a dinner party for about 30 people in the White House. The president didn't attend. He dined by himself in his study and went to bed uh, relatively early. He uh, took a couple phone calls from Cordell Hall, from his uh, political aide, Henry Hopkins. But it was a relatively uneventful day, other than the fact that this communication had gone forward. On Saturday the 6th, people were looking forward to the NFL games the next day. The Redskins were playing a meaningless game against the Philadelphia Eagles. They were still struggling through another losing season. The NFL championship was going to be the Giants had already won the Eastern Division. The West was yet to be decided between the Packers and the Bears. The winner of that game would then meet the Giants for the NFL championship on, uh, later in uh, December. But this country was pretty much, you know, uh, people were go children were going to school. Uh, but there was still a lot of deprivation. There was still a lot of poverty right here in Washington, D.C., right here in our nation's capital. After eight years of the, all the spending of the New Deal, there was still widespread poverty. Something like 50 percent of all enlistees who tried to enlist in the U.S. military were rejected either because of bad teeth or because they were undernourished. Uh, so that tells you about the state of health in America uh, among young men in uh, December of 1941. To understand December 7th, I have to go back to the evening of December 6th. The Japanese government had sent a 14-part communication to their embassy here. 13 parts came through that night. We intercepted it. It was passed among high government officials. They were trying to interpret what the message really meant because nobody thought that Japan was going to declare war or that was going to bomb Pearl Harbor. That was the furthest thing from anybody's mind. In, but there was one ominous message in the 13-part message that came through that night, one ominous sentence, and that was said, after receiving part 14 tomorrow, you are to meet with the Secretary of State at 1 p.m., at which time you will deliver the 14th part of the message, after which you will destroy your code books and destroy your code machines. This is ominous. But even then, we think that the Japanese are only going to break off talks, not diplomatic relations, and certainly not start a war. The next morning, Washington is like it was this morning, only cooler. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a nice day. It was breezy. People were going to matinee theaters. They were going to church. They were reading the Sunday newspaper, the Washington Post, the Washington uh, Times Herald, the, the Washington, uh, other, other Washington newspapers. I think there were a half dozen daily newspapers in Washington at the time. At about uh, 7.30 in Hawaii, which was 1 o'clock our time, over 300 Japanese airplanes dropped out of the sky and attacked our military bases at Fort Island, at uh, uh, Hickok Field, 
and of course at Pearl Harbor. Cordell Hall has scheduled a meeting with the Japanese diplomats, with the ambassadors for one o'clock, but because their typist is slow at the Japanese embassy, the meeting has to be pushed back. Then they were late for the pushed back meeting and then Cordell Hall has to push back another 15 minutes because he's received a phone call from the President of the United States telling him of his phone call from the Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox, that the Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor and attacked Manila, attacked Wake Island, attacked Singapore, attacked the Philippines, all these military, British and American military outposts in the Pacific. At 12.30 on December 8, 1941, time stopped in America. Everything stopped. Wall Street stopped, traffic stopped, commerce stopped. Everybody stopped to listen to a radio, to listen to the President of the United States give a 500-word address to the Congress ask, outlining what had happened and asking for a declaration of war. Immediately, measures are instituted. The whole country goes into what is essentially a lockdown. Blackouts are instituted, curfews are instituted, uh, there's the beginning of the discussion of rationing of uh, consumer goods, beginning of the discussion of rationing of those uh, uh, raw materials that were coming from the Far East that no longer were going to be available to us because the Japanese had taken Thailand uh, and, and other parts of the Far East. The Navy recruiting office in Birmingham within moments after FDR's speech is overwhelmed by applicants. Over 600 applicants in a matter of minutes tried to enlist in the Navy. Uh, at the time, you had to be 21 years of age to enlist in the U.S. military. If you were younger than that, you need to get your parents' permission. But they weren't just getting people who were young men who were, uh, who were of legal age. They were getting boys, 15, 16, 17, trying to enlist. But they're also getting veterans of the World War I and the Spanish-American War who are trying to enlist. They're also getting men who are trying to enlist who want the marriage ban waived so that they too can enlist because at the time married men or if you had dependents couldn't join the U.S. military. The outpouring is, is astonishing. Women are, hundreds, thousands of women are stepping forward to knit socks and turtlenecks and watch caps for the Navy. They're manning uh, these, the, what they call these uh, victory centers all over the country where they hand out coffee and donuts and they act as rest stops uh, uh, for, you know, they're also known as canteens uh, for American military personnel. Everybody is joined in the war effort. Everybody is trying to do something to help the war effort. It is impossible for a man in uniform to uh, stick his thumb out on a road and not be picked up within moments by somebody who's going to give him a lift. And of course, orders were posted at all these canteens on the night of the 7th, be at your post tomorrow morning by the time of revelry. By the time of revelry tomorrow morning, you must be at your post, wherever your assigned post is. If it's Fort Belvoir or Fort McNair or any fort that you were assigned to or any military installation you were assigned to in the country, you had to be there the next morning. Since December 7, 1941, there have been many, many conspiracy theories that have been offered, none proven. There was no conspiracy. FDR did not know, uh, Cordell Hull did not know, the American government did not know that the Japanese were going to attack Pearl Harbor, Manila, Singapore, Wake Island, Guam, Midway on December 7, 1941. It was a, what has uh, been called a failure of imagination. We just couldn't conceive that they could transport six aircraft carriers for thousands of miles along with accompanying uh, uh, troop ships and, uh, and uh, tankers and all this other, this, inf this incredible armada at sea w traveled undetected to just 100 miles off the coast of Oahu. Uh, the conspiracy theory just doesn't hold water. FDR knew America was going to become involved in the war sooner or later and he'd already taken steps under Len Lease to give aid to uh, Stalin and, uh, and Russia, to give aid to Churchill and Great Britain, to give aid to the Free French under Charles de Gaulle, to give aid to the, uh, to the Chinese under Chiang Kai-shek. So we were already invested in the war in terms of material. A lot of American 
uh, flyers resigned their commissions and joined the Chinese Air Force to fight against the Japanese. But America was not formally in the war. We didn't want to be formally in the war. FDR was and Cornell Hall, the Secretary of State, were doing everything they can to engage in diplomatic relations to keep us from going to war with, uh, with Japan. As of the 6th, the war everybody thought we were going to be into eventually was the European War, not the Pacific War. But curiously enough, ironically enough, it's the Pacific War we're engaged in first, which then triggers our involvement in the European War. As the FBI is rounding up uh, Japanese nationals, here in Washington, uh, they're also engaging in this policy, including the owners of uh, proprietors of many dry cleaning operations. And for a time, Washington men could not get their suits and shirts until they, these Japanese Americans, these Japanese were released so that they could reopen their establishments so men in Washington could get their shirts and ties. Uh, more seriously for the Japanese is that this was, uh, anybody who's a civil libertarian is going to be appalled at what happened to the Japanese in this country. In 1924, over the objections of Calvin Coolidge, Congress passed a law that prevented Japanese from becoming American citizens. And it was even open to question whether or not a child, a Japanese child, or a child born to Japanese parents in this country was considered a naturalized American. That was even open to question. Uh, the Japanese newspapers were routinely shut down. Japanese banks were seized. Japanese Americans are arrested in New York, they're arrested in Washington, they're arrested in Alabama, they're arrested out on the West Coast. Quarantines are put around them in Los Angeles and San Francisco, uh, where they were, where there are fishing communities that were dominated by, uh, by Japanese in Los Angeles Harbor and uh, San Francisco Bay. Uh, but we also start rounding up and arresting uh, German Americans and uh, Italian Americans, not in the numbers uh, that we did with Japanese Americans, but they too were, uh, were uh, rounded up for uh, questioning and some, some detained and some imprisoned as we now know. Uh, is the, um, uh, and Robert Morgenthau, who is the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, comes out of a meeting with FDR the night of December 7th and immediately announces um, a ban on most Japanese commerce. Uh, Japanese, they clo we closed the borders. Japanese cannot enter the country, they can't leave the country. They can't get on a, a ship to leave the country. They can't get on a commercial airplane. Many trains are told that if you have a Japanese individual on your plane to notify, the uh, conductors are told to not notify the nearest FBI office. Uh, and, and this is nationwide. Of course, on December 6th, this is, a, this is an isolationist country. Polling showed, Gallup polling showed, the overwhelming majority of Americans w did not want to go into the European war, did not want to get into uh, what we, we didn't call it World War II. Uh, we didn't refer to World War I as World War I. That was simply the Great War. Uh, we referred to this as the emergency or the war effort, but it was not called World War II. Uh, the leader, one of the leaders of the, of the America First movement was, of course, Charles Aviator, the famous, uh, Charles Lindbergh, the famous aviator who had across the Atlantic alone uh, several years before. He, along with uh, uh, other uh, Americans, prominent Americans from the left and the right, with Lowell Thomas, Her uh, uh, Herbert Hoover, Alf Landon, there were many people who were part of the America First movement, both liberals and conservatives, who did not want America to go into the war. Lindbergh has given, uh, Lindbergh has given many, many prominent speeches in the Midwest and around the country, tearing into Roosevelt, advocating staying out of the European conflict. As of December 7th, he goes into hiding on Martha's Vineyard, he and his family and his wife. He refuses to take phone calls. He refuses to answer uh, reporters' telegrams. The America First movement disappears within moments after uh, December 7th, 1941. They were so strong, they were so muscular that they had announced on December 5th 
that they were going to participate in every congressional election in the country. They were going to open up offices and they were going to have a hand in making sure that the candidates who ran for Congress in 1942 were isolationists. There's probably four times in American history where the question came up, where were you when you heard? In April of 1865, when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, I'm sure that people in Washington, people around the country, when they heard it, remembered exactly where they were and under what circumstances. On November, 20, November 22nd, 1963, when John Kennedy was assassinated, everybody, I was in second grade. I remember the principal coming in, tears streaming down her face. It was a gray, overcast day in Syracuse, New York and she told us that President Kennedy had been assassinated. The school was let out early. I went home and my father was there. We had a little black and white television. He was a city firefighter in Syracuse and I remember I was in second grade, so I'd been, I guess, about nine, ten years old. And I remember standing on the coffee table crying uncontrollably as my father was consoling me. Another time when people said, where were you when was obviously September 11th, 2001? And then, of course, December 7th, 1941. Everybody who was conscious and alive remembers where they were when they heard about the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. For me personally, World War II has great poignancy, meaning, tragedy. My father's oldest brother, Ellsworth. His nickname was Barney after the comic strip Barney Google. There was an old comic strip called Snuffy Smith and a character and there was Barney Google and he had big eyes and when my uncle was born his grandfather looked at him and said well he looks like, just like Barney Google. So Barney became his nickname and he was always Barney. Uh, he tried to enlist uh, in uh, early 1941. His parents said no you're too young. He enlisted a year later. The army had a great need for people who were skilled uh, in radio maintenance, broadcasting, and operations, and, and he had gotten his uh, high school, they used to have what they call vocational schools in those days, and his degree was in electronics, his high school degree. Barney uh, was assigned to Boston, Providence, uh, down, down at Pensacola, and then finally was assigned to the USS Essex in the Pacific uh, on board a TBF-1 Avenger. It was a three-man crew. President Bush President Bush 41 flew the very same plane. He was off the San Jacinto, but he flew the very same plane, a TBF-1 Avenger. It had a three-man crew. There was, uh, with my, uh, in January of 1945, my uncle was er trying to earn enough air hours to be promoted from airman second class to airman first class. It was a voluntary mission. He volunteered for it, but that day the plane only took off with a two-man crew, it was just the pilot and my uncle who doubled as radio operator and turret gunner. Their mission was to bomb Japanese docks uh, in uh, 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 Saigon. The plane made its pass, dropped its uh, bombs, and as it was circling around, was shot down. They crashed in the park in Saigon. The pilot survived and was captured, and was protected for a time by the French underground. As he was leaving the plane, Colonel, uh, 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 Lieutenant uh, McHenry, Donald McHenry was the pilot, uh, was asked by these, uh, these, uh, the, these members of the French underground, are you alone in their broken English? And he gave them the thumbs up sign. He th thought he was saying there's one more in the plane they thought he was saying he was alone. It was just him. He was, he was taken, off, taken and, and, uh, and bandaged up and protected for a time. The Japanese discovered my uncle still alive in the plane and they killed him. We don't know if they bayoneted him or they shot him, but he was obviously injured from the crash. And so World War II, I grew up hearing stories about Barney and about his charm and about how he, popular he was with girls and, uh, and what is really most poignant I think is that he was shot down and killed on his 20th birthday in January of 1945. 
Barney represents a long line of tradition of our family. My mother's great-great-grandfather was at Valley Forge. Daniel Cohn was at Valley Forge fighting for George Washington. Members of the Shirley, McGivern, Cohn, Abbott families have fought in every war in this country's history. My nephew was a tank commander uh, in the Iraqi invasion in uh, 2003. Uh, we had, my father was served during the Korean War, his brother served in the Marine Corps during the Korean War. My son was a corpsman in the United States Navy. So for me, the subject of the book uh, is, is very powerful and is very poignant. The reaction in this country after December 7th, 1941 is much the same as the reaction after September 11th, 2001, in that we knew we'd been attacked. We'd been horribly attacked. We'd been monstrously, monstr monstrously attacked by people who never bothered to even go through the formality of declaring war on us first. And many civilians were killed in Pearl Harbor as were on, on September 11th, 1941. What happens in the country in both instances is an understandable reaction because it's fueled by fear, ignorance, and anger. Rumors sweep this country about imminent bombings of New York City and Los Angeles and uh, Boston. Just as rumors swept this country in the days after September 11th about more imminent attacks that are coming, there wasn't anybody the afternoon of September 11th, 2001, who didn't think that we weren't going to be hit again. Everybody was convinced. The only question is wh where and how uh, Al Qaeda was going, to, was going to do this. We knew after December 7th, we were going to be hit again, is that what we failed to imagine now became a tragic reality and that our imaginations expanded to include all, all, not just the possible but the impossible. I'm Andrew Shirley. I'm the second son of Craig Shirley and for the past year I've been the lead researcher on December 1941. St the untold story about the month that changed America and saved the world. Now, in doing this research, one of the most interesting things has been coming to terms with the limitations of what my culture, my society, my generation has accepted to be truth about 1941 and about World War II and about what has been aptly called the greatest generation. We've been led to believe, well, my generation at least, that they were inherently great. We've seen movies, read books about all these heroic deeds and indeed and they were rightly earned and honestly so but the story about how it came about the culture the society how it shifted how it went from a great depression the country coming together uniting and defeating evil or evil and protecting freedom throughout the world is really a truly remarkable story and that all these preconceived notions that we've sort of had about World War II are really just that, just notions, and really in no way factual. One of the most interesting of which has been the story of Charles Lindbergh, in which it's sort of accepted today that Charles Lindbergh was a Nazi and he's been portrayed as such in recent publications. In reality, he was never a Nazi. He was never that. He was, American, he was a member of American First, a movement that was sweeping the nation. The nation did not want to go to war before December 7th. And post-war, he actually tried several times to enlist, and he was not allowed to. And many stories similar to that that have been coming out and just sort of reiterate how little really has been taught to us that is actually true, and more has just been sort of in generic facts. It's really been quite fascinating. I've been researching the uh, December 1941 for over a year now, and by far one of the most interesting things was the myth of the American war machine leading up to December 7th and that I've always been led to believe that the United States had soldiers, tanks, planes ready to go on the assembly lines just waiting for the queue to go to war. In reality, the United States was nowhere near ready. We were undermanned, underprepared. We didn't have the military resources we needed. The whole country mobilized out of necessity and it was an organic mobilization. It wasn't, pre it wasn't preconceived or planned or arranged. It was done naturally as the country needed and all that stuff the way it, how it emerged in that way, and that it wasn't part of some grand scheme, or it wasn't part of some great architect's plan, or FDR's 
knocking nations long before the war, is possibly one of the most interesting things about this. Whereas this is my father's third book, this is actually the first one I've ever researched or had any major contribution to in any way. And getting to work with him side by side over the past year has really, it's been a lot of fun. Sort of understanding the way, how he, how he writes, how history sort of comes together and how you build the basis of what is to become these fascinating stories that almost everyone has forgotten. It's really quite interesting and it's really personally meant a lot to me.